Good morning, church. Um, I usually do these on Saturday, but we had quite a busy Saturday yesterday, and so I'm actually doing this on Sunday morning. It's a novel idea, preaching a sermon on Sunday morning, I know, but here we are. These are fun times we live in. I can't wait until we get to do this live again, till I get to look you in the face instead of staring in this camera, and you guys don't have to watch me on a video. We can sing together and take communion together. But I'm also proud that we live or, and work as a part of a congregation that loves neighbors. And we are doing this to love our neighbors. All those years of singing songs about who God is and talking from scripture about who God is and praying to the God that we confess in those songs and those prayers and gathering around the table of that God. Uh, they have been preparing us for the task of loving our communities and that's what we're trying our best to do right now and so it stinks and it's non optimal but it is um, sort of thing that sounds like Jesus and so here we are this is the second week of Easter and it's when we focus on life and what God is doing in the world and last week we talked about first Peter first uh, Peter Peter was writing to a group of Christians who were undergoing hardships and trials. They had a lot going on in their lives. They lived in an empire where the government was hostile to um, what they were trying to do most of the time. Their values were not in sync with the rest of the society. Uh, they lived in uh, an environment where oftentimes they were lower class, they were slaves and servants. They had people in authority over them who were hostile to who they were and what they were trying to do and they lived in an environment Peter would talk about where uh, there were various Jewish groups around the empire who were also hostile to what they were trying to do and so they had trials they had hardships uh, they had lots of things going on and so Peter's book is about how to act as a follower of Jesus in hardship Peter knew a lot about this his uh, early first century audience knew a lot about this as well. And Second Peter really picks up the same sorts of themes, except for in Second Peter, uh, the trials and hardships aren't coming from external forces like governments or superiors or groups that are chasing you around and hassling you. But the trials in Second Peter come from people inside the church. And I know that's hard to believe that sometimes people inside the church would cause as much drama and static and hardship as people outside the church. But there you have it. Every now and then it happens. We're not going to point fingers or call names, but probably all of us have that little twitch that happens when you think about that sort of thing. And so in talking about these hardships um, coming from inside the church, Peter writes this second letter to try to encourage Christians to remain faithful. And one of the things that these people inside the church were doing to discourage those following Jesus uh, was saying something to the effect uh, that, you know, all of this following Jesus stuff was a waste of time. Here you are, they would say, looking for uh, this end of the world event, the coming of Jesus, the reconciliation of all things, the restoration of all things, the resurrection of all people, like Jesus was resurrected to come. And they would say, you're betting your entire life on it. And you're keeping yourself from doing a variety of things that everybody else is doing, some of which are actually pretty fun. Uh, because of all of those end of the world type things and you're really just wasting your time. Jesus is not going to come back. The resurrection is not going to happen. Here you are being a goody two-shoes, denying yourself all of these pleasures for some myth, for some false promise, for something that's never really going to happen in the first place. So why are you wasting your time? And in the face of all of this, what Peter does is he reminds those who follow Jesus that of all of the people in the world they are the ones who know the end of the story they know how all of this is going to end and by the way he doesn't really get into this in his book he just rehearses the story for them which we'll get to in a second but he he would say and Paul would agree with him in other places that we know the end of the story because we've seen the end of the story 
we've seen the end of the story. We know who wins because God has already dealt that um, not final but decisive blow to death and sin and Satan and the powers of brokenness in the world. God has already demonstrated his overwhelming ability and tenacity for and desire to reconcile his world. He's already demonstrated the truth of the message that the, the gospel is not that the world is broken and we're all going to hell, but that God loves our broken world and that he's fixing. He's demonstrated all of that already. He's shown us the end of the story in the resurrection of Jesus. It was in the resurrection of Jesus that death was felt or dealt its, its death blow. It was in the resurrection of Jesus that God demonstrates his ability to overcome even the largest forces of darkness and bring about his reconciliation. It was in Jesus that we saw a preview, a foretaste, a trailer for the end of the story. And so this isn't wild guessing for Christians. This isn't supposition. This is not some futurist making predictions about what's going to happen in the future. Jesus is the end of the story. He came back into the middle of the story and demonstrated what that end will look like. God wins. God defeats death. Everything is reconciled to him. And so Peter, talking to these Christians in the midst of their hardship, he says to them, you know how this story ends. He reminds them they are a group of people who knows where all of this is going. They don't have to be up in the air about how things are going. And so this is um, what he says, starting in verse 8 of First Peter chapter 3, or Second Peter, rather, chapter 3. He says, Don't let it escape your notice, dear friends, that with the Lord a single day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a single day. The Lord isn't slow to keep his promise, as some think of slowness, but he is patient towards you, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to change their hearts and lives. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and on that day the heavens will pass away with a dreadful noise. And the elements will be consumed by fire, and the earth and all the works done on it will be exposed. And since everything will be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be? You must live holy and godly lives, waiting for and hastening the coming day of God. Because of that day, the heavens will be destroyed and fire and by fire, and the elements will melt away in the flames. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness is at home. He says, don't forget, even though some people say, oh yeah, God's never coming back. He would have come back already if he was going to come back. This whole thing is a hoax. You're wasting your time. Go live your life. Be merry, prosper. He says, unlike those people, don't forget that you know where all of this is going. And by the way, it's not going where uh, I so often heard that it was going when I was growing up. We like to focus on the verses leading up to verse 12, where it's all doom and fire and brimstone and destruction. And if we had time this morning, and we don't have time this morning, we could talk about how those metaphors are used throughout Scripture and how it's not always a, a negative thing, that fire is often used as a purifying element, as a redemptive element rather than a destructive element. But notice, if nothing else, that after all of the fire and the destruction and the melting and the burning away. He says in verse 13, what we're really waiting for, uh, the fire and the destruction and the burning and the melting, that's not the end of the story. What we're really waiting for is the coming of God's promise where we have new heavens and new earth. That is where, according to the Old Testament prophets, God has taken his good creation and all of its uh, brokenness and bentness because of sin and death, and he has restored and reconciled and put it all back together the way it's supposed to be. He says, we're waiting for new heavens and new earth where righteousness is at home, where righteousness fits in. Of course, righteousness is that word we've talked about before. We could write doctoral dissertations on it. People have. Uh, but at the end of the day, for our purposes, we might say that righteousness is what you have when things work the way they're supposed to work. 
And so interestingly for Peter here, he says, you know the end of the story. And so the question is not, um, where is all of this going? In a tumultuous election year with all sorts of uncertainty and the economy falling apart and a, a virus causing all sorts of havoc on our economy and our lives and our communities and those around the world, the question is not, Peter would say, where is all of this going? We know where all of this is going. We know that at the end of the day, no matter what happens here, God is bigger than that thing. We know that no matter what Satan and death and sin can throw at us, God is bigger than that thing. And at the end, he wins. The end of the story is he brings about his new heavens, his new earth, where the way things ought to be is at home. That's where this is going. And so in the middle of the hardship for a people who is certain of where the story is going, Peter says the real question is what sort of people are you? It's the question he asked there, you'll remember right in the middle of it. Verse 11, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you be? That's the question before us now, right? Not where is it going, not who's going to win, not what's going to happen, but what sort of people are we because we are those who know the end of the story. How has the victory of God, how is the resurrection of Jesus, how is... Uh, the defeat of death on his cross and in his resurrection how has following him changed us and in times of trial that's when we actually get to find out how we would answer that question it's in times of trial not times of ease that perhaps we see most easily the sort of people we become it's when we are under stress when things are hard when there's a sacrifice when it's not um, all sunshine and roses that we get to ask the sort of question Peter's asking here. You know how the story's in. What kind of people are we? It's not hard to be loving when you like everybody that you're around and you don't have to deal with people who rub you the wrong way, who are annoying you, or who are frustrating you. It, it's not hard to praise God and to thank Him for our blessings and to worship Him when everything is going right. It's not hard to be light in the world when we can uh, pretend like everything's not really all that dark in the first place. But it's when everything's going wrong. When stress is up to our eyeballs, when anxieties are up to our eyeballs, when everything is falling apart, when we're scared, when we're uncertain of what tomorrow will hold, when we're constantly worried about what's gonna happen next. When economies are crashing and governments are uncertain and nobody knows which news source to trust and there's a virus wreaking havoc all around the world and people are getting sick and people are dying, it's at those times that we come to see what sort of people we are, what story we live out of, whether are we the people who, whether we are the people who say we have a story. It is the story of Jesus and his cross and his death and his resurrection. And we know where this is going. Or is the story of fear and power where everything is falling apart and we got to just try to buckle down and survive. And you take care of your stuff over there, but we're going to take care of us. And so the question I want you to think about this week is... Um, what do our responses to this time of hardship say about our faith? Because it's times like these that we come to understand who we are, what story we live out of. Are we in times of hardship living out of the Jesus story, one of hope and comfort and strength and love and grace and goodness and mercy and selflessness? Or are we living out of some other story? Some story sold by the liberal side of things or conservative side of things. Some story that is intent on casting accusations at the other side as if any of us caused this virus. What sort of people are we? 
what does this crisis show us about who we are? Because at the end of the day, Peter says, you know how this is all going to end, right? You know that these trials are ultimately only temporary, that God wins in the end. And so be free to live like it. Be free to go out and be in wise and mature and responsible ways with creativity and wisdom and courage the people of Christ what sort of people ought we be church let me pray for you and then I want you to pray with me um, it's times like these by the way that the importance of praying the Lord's Prayer every week comes into the forefront it's times like these where when we pray those lines for instance uh, give us this day our daily bread that we have opportunity to reflect on whether or not we really mean that do we really believe are we the sort of people that really believe that God is not only capable but willing and faithful trustworthy to provide for us and are we the sort of people who trust in him enough that we can um, change the way we treat those around us accordingly? And so let's pray. Father God, we know where all of this is going. We know that these times are dark, and that things are frustrating, and that things are scary, and that things are hard. But in these dark and frustrating and scary and hard times, help us attend to you. Help us to love our neighbors because they represent you, they bear your image. Whether they be liberal or conservative, whether they be easy to love or hard to love, whoever they are, you made them you love them and your son died for them and now we come to you and we pray as a family our father who art in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts we've forgiven those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and your mind and your soul and your body. This is the first and great commandment. A second one like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And about, upon these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. And we love because God first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates a brother or sister, he is a liar. Because the person who doesn't love a brother or sister who can be seen can't love God who can't be seen. This commandment we have from him, those who claim to love God ought to love their brother and sister also. Church, go out into God's world that he loves very much and remember who he has created us to be. We love you. We miss you. We can't wait to see you again. But just hold on to this this week. You know where all this is going. You know how the story ends. Live like it. God bless you.